Consider supporting Archeosoup on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month. Link available in the video description. Thank you. Hello, Francis. Good morning. <laughs> Hello, Mark. Hi. Hello, <laughs> we hello. We got there. <laughs> we did, we did. I've been trying to organise a little chat with you since February this year. Yeah. Uh, ever since I first came across a news story in The Courier, I believe, yeah. um, talking about the discovery of uh, an ancient instrument, or, or a bit of an instrument, in a, a Perth Loch. And this, I find this fascinating because... Uh, music is in particular, but also sound in general, is often an overlooked aspect of prehistory in particular. And frankly, history as well, actually, unless it's serving some sort of dramatic function in like a drama, maybe. Um, mm. And so this, 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 I'm just fascinated by this. So first of all, can you just introduce yourself, where you mm. are, and what exactly am, am, I, am I hinting at here? Yeah, sure, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's absolutely fine. Um, well, uh, I, I'm Francis. My name's Francis Collinson, um, and I'm the curator here at the Scottish Cranog Centre. Um, and we're in central Perthshire on the uh, banks of Loch Tay. Uh -huh. And um, you find uh, in Scotland and in Ireland that some high status people, or indeed, you know, you could use these buildings for other purposes, but some people lived on um, structures called Cranogs, yeah. which are loch dwellings, basically, um, mm -hmm. beautiful looking structures, you know, very impressive. Um, and uh, most of the Irish ones are Bronze Age in date, but here in Scotland, you're looking at the uh, early uh, to mid Iron Age period, uh, right through actually to, to, to later on in the Iron Age. Um, and we have here a reconstruction of one based on... Um, uh, excavations of one particular cranog here in Loch Tay uh -huh. um, and as you say yes we have got this uh, intriguing little item that's uh, that's come from there I suppose the thing to say first of all about that as a but before I get on to the item itself is that um, because a cranog when it is finally abandoned uh, it will collapse into the water of the yes. loch yes. and you end up with a mound of material plus all the artifacts and things which basically are fantastically preserved. They've been in that very anaerobic, waterlogged state for two and a half thousand years in our case. Uh -huh. um, so you do find a level of preservation of organic material that you wouldn't normally get on a dry land site. Yeah. Um, and as you say, we've found an intriguing little artifact, um, which is possibly part of a, a musical instrument. Um, and yes, a stunning preservation. Um, and, and that was the case with all of our with all of our artifacts. Uh -huh. um, so what we have here at the Cranog Centre, um, if um, if people haven't visited, we have the reconstruction which we take people onto with a with a tour guide. Uh, we have a museum and we're displaying some of the uh, artifacts um, or most of the artifacts found uh, on excavations this year as part of a development project of the museum displays. Uh -huh. That's happening this summer. Um, and then we also have a, a little compound, a demonstration area, almost like an Iron Age village, if you like, where we do ancient technologies, green woodworking, fire making. We've got the Celtic kitchen where you can go down to the clay oven area and have a taster of Iron Age food. Um, okay. And we have an ancient textile shelter with spinning, weaving and dyeing. And all of it's based on our, our, on our discoveries. So the food, for example, is cooked with ingredients or foods that we know were found on the Cranog site. Would that be based on, uh, just to clarify for people at home, would that be based on residues that are found in in remnants of, of food or, or, or perhaps uh, yeah. bowls and platters that are used to prepare food that are found within the Cranog remains? Yes, yeah. in some cases uh, we do have some uh, some clay uh, pot fragments and they have got burnt food stuck to them. Um, uh -huh. So absolutely, we'd like to get that analysed and find out exactly what uh, what they had for dinner. Um, but um, uh, there was a PhD thesis that was done on the archaeobotanical um, um, remnants uh, and discoveries mm -hmm. of the uh, Cranog. So it's uh, the basis of, all, of that plant list that came out of that work. Right. Uh, we've been able be... to sort of determine what they grew on the farm and what they ate and so forth. Okay, and is, is, that, and is that sort of burnt seeds remains that was analysed? Yeah, like? it yeah. is some seed remains. Mm -hmm. um, we've got um, some extraordinary um, 
Uh, yeah, yeah, we de- definitely plants. So we know that they were growing spelt wheat and emma wheat and barley on their on their farm on the farmland right. adjacent to the Cranog site. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got evidence of rye and flax there as well. Uh-huh. Lots of edible weeds as well, which could have been crop contaminants from the ploughing of the fields, okay. um, or they may have been deliberately gathered. You know, because uh-huh, yeah. um, right. as you know, there's lots of stuff in the hedgerow still today that's edible. Yeah. Uh, lots of berries, uh, as you say, that are being gathered. Um, but we've got fantastic things um, uh, in the artifacts themselves. For example, we've got half of a dish that's got perforations in the base of it. Okay. And when it was first found, there was a grey slimy stuff stuck to it. Uh, and, and this was a butter dish, and the grey stuff was the butter. So we have that on display in the museum, a butter dish and two and a half thousand year old butter. Nice. Uh, which is now nice. dried grey crumbs, you know. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, it's a fab- fabulous evidence of what they were eating. So, so does that mean if uh, if people sort of want to have like a, a, a <laughs> an ironic authentic experience, do you actually have like food coloured butter in the cafe, <laughs> like grey <laughs> butter, <laughs> or not? I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't sell very well grey butter. Perhaps perhaps not. So so really, it sounds as though what what you're describing there is a series of different textures that come out of. Uh, of an, an, an analyzing this collapsed mound and essentially just again just for folks at home a cranog is kind of like a roundhouse that's on stilts uh, out in a in a loch or a lake and it's there possibly for defensive purposes but also there's a certain status that comes with building over the water i imagine as well water was a very significant place for uh, for iron age folk and um, and it, so, so there are various questions that, that are being explored here, and I like the different textures that are coming out of this research. Um, mm-hmm. But um, but but in particular, I, I often imagine going into one of these spaces and sitting down for a meal, and maybe yeah, possibly if I'm lucky, uh, getting some lovely cut of meat or something or, or whatever uh, as a, as a guest. Um, but also, it's the sounds, and not more often than not, I tend to think about. Iron Age and Bronze Age music is being based on wind instruments. For example, there are there are uh, bronze um, trumpets and the like, which have come out of, uh, for example, bogs in Ireland. Um, but but the, in this instance, we're talking about a stringed instrument, and uh, th- that must have implications for the quality of the sound and maybe even also the narrative potential of that music in these sorts of settings. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. Yes, and uh, and yes, you've got to think about as you were saying just now. You've got to think about the use of the uh, of the house. So. Um, um, uh, c- certainly, um, in our case, it's used as a domestic dwelling. We know that in other cases, uh, cranogs might have been used just for storing things. Mm-hmm. They might have done one or two technologies or processes on them. They might have used them to um, keep the animals safe, herded out there, um, safely guarded. Um, it's um, it's more uh, ra- rather than defensive. It's probably fair to say that we're looking more at security and yeah. privacy, mm. perhaps rather than mm. defensive in the sense of you know warfare. Um, but yeah, multiple uses of them and. You're you're absolutely right you've got that central space um, around the hearth which can be used um, for many things we know that food is a very powerful political and social um, tool that human beings use you know mm-hmm. no, no other animal really does mm-hmm. and um, you have that space as well acoustic space for uh, it's an oral tradition we know that so perhaps somebody was telling the stories of the ancestors purely through speech and poem and song and so forth um, and, and and absolutely right that that whole sound uh, uh, and 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 history of music is is absolutely fascinating. Mm. Um, we know that uh, as you say, the very earliest forms of sound are going to be mimicking nature in some way. So perhaps it's either going to be a percussive. You know, you can s- simply knock two stones together and get some kind of a sound like that. Mm-hmm. You might make a very simple uh, whistle, um, which might mimic a bird call. So you can use these instruments to lure animals into traps and so forth and nets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be the first sort of use, I suppose, of uh, deliberate use of sound in in some capacity. Mm. And we do, in fact, uh, we, we will talk about the lyre bridge, but we actually do have a little whistle as well in our collection. So we've got two items uh, that relate to music on the Cranog, and both of those will be uh, going on display. And our little mi- whistle does actually mimic uh, a bird call uh, oh, from the okay. replicas, I hasten to add, not from uh, blowing the original. Mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. So that's absolutely lovely. But in the case of our Lyre Bridge, um, this isn't just mimicking nature. This is a very deliberate attempt to make music. And as you say, putting uh, this into the realm of stringed instruments takes it into a class of its own. Yeah. Um, 
what I can show you is a 3D printed replica of this fascinating little item we've got. Uh -huh. uh, we've sent the original off um, for some analysis, so I'm afraid I haven't got that with me. But I'll try and hold that up for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Um, and yeah, what good. you have... Is that okay? Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, and what that is, is a small um, piece of wood. It's broken, as you can see, at the uh, at my left end, um, other end from where I'm holding it. So you've got uh, one, two, three, four, you've got five and a half notches there. Mm. It probably would originally have had seven notches. Okay, okay. Um, and I'll just turn it around so you can see the other side of it there as well. Uh -huh. um, so seven notches. Um, and we're working with some music archaeologists who are convinced that this is the bridge um, or, or we're 95% convinced, I should uh, just uh, add that, uh, that this is a bridge from a, uh, a stringed instrument and quite possibly that was a lyre. Right. Um, so if, for people who don't necessarily know what a bridge is, um, apologies for the huge lorry just uh, backing up or doing something out in the lane outside. It's okay. Um, this, uh, this the, the, the original lyre would not have looked like this. This uh -huh. is just a modern uh, replica. but. Uh, the bridge is this piece here, mm -hmm. which is holding the strings up. Yes, yeah. The body. It, it's keeping them proud of the body there. Yeah. And um, so, <coughs> so yeah. Fr from this piece, then, I, I immediately have various questions. So, so uh, with my, I've got limited experience with violin playing, but also obviously guitar playing. And immediate, my immediate question is how far away from the bridge? Would the strings extend, for example, on the fingerboard or whatever it is one wants to call it, or or, or even if it wasn't a fingerboard, if it was stretched out over a frame, how yeah. how long are are you able to make any guesses as to how long those strings might have been, or indeed what the strings might have been actually in terms of material? Yeah, hmm. yes, absolutely. We'll we'll, we'll ho we're hopefully um, are going to get all of that detail from um, from our. Um, our colleagues who are, who are working with us, these music archaeologists, uh -huh. who are going to be uh, doing this for us. But whether or not that did have a, a tailpiece as well, uh -huh. or whether the bridge was actually, you know, further down and not needing that, or indeed further up, it probably did have this sort of hollow, ho hollow sort of space here, uh -huh. but uh, with branch-like arms perhaps stretching yes. up. Yeah. It may well have had a tortoiseshell body underneath. Okay. Uh -huh. um, and that might suggest that we're looking at um, a Mediterranean import. Oh. Uh, another possibility is that the lyre might have been um, Nordic uh, in origin, or indeed uh -huh. it may well have been assembled and made uh, made locally. Uh -huh. The strings, we're probably looking at gut, um, but possibly plaited horsehair as well. Right. Um, but again, we know from some of those very those uh, classical Greek lyres that um, gold strings perhaps are not unheard of gold. in the classical world. Wow, okay, yeah. yes, yes. Um, and the pegs, uh, as well could have been of, of wood um, uh -huh. but we're probably looking at gut or horsehair for the uh, for the strings of the lyre okay okay and so so will will uh, the the archaeologists working on the musical elements of this will they be experimenting with different resonance chambers different sizes and lengths and and different types of, of string yes to see what how the bridge works best perhaps yes yeah yeah they are and the other fascinating thing about it is that the instrument itself could be t totally transformed uh -huh. uh, in terms of use if it had a hand strap at the back. Because with this one, if you hold it with your left hand as I'm doing, uh -huh. then that just frees up the right hand just to do music there. Yeah. Um, so it'll sound beautiful, but it'll sound very light, almost like a gentle harp. Uh -huh. But if you've got a hand strap at the back uh -huh. that loops around the back of it, you can wrap that once around your wrist and that actually means that you don't have to use this hand to support the thing because the strap does that. So you can begin to do things with these fingers as well. I see. Yeah, yeah almost like a harpsichord in that sense. Uh, well, you would make it much more loud, I think, and much yeah. more raucous sounding. Um, so whether we're looking at quite vigorous uh, sounding music or whether that would have been more gentle okay. would perhaps be dependent on, whether, dependent on whether or not there was a... A uh, hand strap there, yeah. so it's fascinating. One instrument, but potentially two totally different sounds, uh -huh, uh -huh. depending on whether or not certain components are there or not. Now, it, it, obviously, this is just speculation. But in 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 your opinion, or indeed in in uh, if, if you want to be even more abstract, in someone's opinion, is it possible that we're looking at music that would be um, 
tonal as we would recognize it in terms of tones and semitones and this kind of thing or more mm. more like a um, a soundscape perhaps being created mm. by these instruments because i've been i've been to performances where people have um say been performing beowulf using a lyre and and they it de depends on the player sometimes they attempt to do something a bit a bit sort of like a like a score like a tonal yes. score but yes. in other cases it's often just a case of uh they they reinforce a calamity or action with some frantic kind of noise on the on the instrument mm. and, and so what 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 is your instinct or what is the instinct of people who you've spoken to about how these instruments would have been used in 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 iron age scotland then Mm. Yeah, um, and to be to be honest, I don't know um, uh, yet about that. They mm. they have suggested that um, for a start, that is as you say, just a purely chromatic um, uh, uh, um, uh, run up there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, on the strings. But uh, initially, they were thinking that that would have been used um, in its quieter, more sort of ethereal form. Um, it might have been quite a sort of special occasion that you'd use something like this um a funeral procession a chieftain's march uh -huh. um a procession of some kind um so some kind of significant social or cultural uh, event um and that's at the moment what we're looking at potentially for iron age scotland uh, that it was used at the this idea of a more raucous uh, use that you can get with the with the hand strap would be based on the fact that if you're looking at uh, liars that have been um, found or believed to have been used in things like Viking beer halls and sort of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, mead drinking halls or uh, uh, things from early medieval life where there's lots of boisterous fun and games and activity going on and, and shouting. A, a gentle sound would never be heard. You'd have no. to have a, a, a you yeah. know harsher strum just to sort of get above that uh, yeah. the noise of all the hubbub. Um, but for our Iron Age Scotland, we are potentially looking at uh, a slightly <coughs> more ethereal, uh, ethereal sound. Right. Um, but uh, don't quote me on that until we've. Uh, we're hoping to get this exhibition done by the fifth. Uh, that's going to be mounted uh, on the fifth of October right. with a replica of what the lyre would have looked like, okay. plus our little um, bridge and the whistle on display. So by then we will know much more uh, about this. Okay, cool, cool. Well I'll, well, I'll definitely have to check back in with you then at some point. Yeah, do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd love to uh, but, let but, you know but, how it's all gone. Simply have to get some something, uh, you know, after all these months of, of back and forth. But um, yeah. I, I suppose I'm, uh, there's one, one final thing then that, that I'm curious about is um, as as the, the you know, this, this Cranog Centre, um, how do you walk that line, especially in terms of musicality, uh, between Iron Age culture and what people think of as some sort of primal Scottish culture, if that's what I mean. So mm -hmm. there's probably a temptation to go, if, as you say, in, if, if there's like an ephemeral sounding music, to go towards that kind of slightly romantic, broadly speaking, uh, very inappropriate use of the word, but Celtic -y kind of mm -hmm. kind of music. Um, mm -hmm. How, how do you walk that line? Because I guess you have to meet people's expectations to a certain extent, but are mm. you trying to, to, to also say, well, actually, what we now have, what we've inherited via things like uh, pipes and violins and whatever yeah. now, is, is, a, is probably related, but it's a different social and musical culture. And so, so what, mm. how, how are you negotiating that, I guess, is, yes. is what I'm curious about. Yeah, absolutely. No, that, that is an interesting one, isn't it? And I... I, I think probably we're we're we're, we're being informed. Um, potentially, we're going to be informed by the Gaelic language itself, which is so embedded in the landscape and mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm. natural world, mm -hmm. um, which makes it a very difficult language to learn <laughs> and um, and to sort of try and express because it, it is it is so as I say just embedded so much in in that natural uh, that natural environment mm -hmm. that. Um, some of the later poems and music are definitely sort of um, uh, fed into that. Mm. And it's quite possible that with our Cranog dwellers speaking a form of Gaelic language mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, of some kind, uh, that quite possibly they were being very much informed um, by that. What we're doing for the exhibition um, is uh, we have actually um, had a poem <coughs> By one of our volunteers, who's um, who's uh, who's a young man. He's only 17, but he's uh, 
he, he's rapidly losing his sight and he'll be completely blind actually very, very, very soon. But right. he comes here to volunteer as a way to sort of uh, get confidence in um, uh, in not just doing some of the skills that we demonstrate, but, you know, learning uh, uh, how to, you know, just sort of getting confidence in talking to people and so on. He absolutely loves coming here and it's been a, a very good sort of rewarding experience for him as well as for us. Mm. And we asked him to write a poem for us about the Cranog um, and... Um, how he thought that the people would have reacted to their landscape and worked and lived mm. within it mm. um, and we asked him to do that because he wrote a fabulously um, poetic very emotive uh, blog for our website mm -hmm. so we knew he was the person to do that and one of our um, colleagues who is a Gaelic speaker has translated that into Gaelic, Gaelic for us right. and we're get, then going to ask our music archaeologists um, what kind of music that probably would have sounded like and we're going to uh, create a sound installation in the museum that is our Gaelic speaking uh, words, the poem, uh, accompanied uh, by the lyre, mm -hmm. um, which will be definitely our own interpretation of course, a bit of a modern spin on this, um, but in terms of the authenticity we will know much more about that very specific, uh, very specific answer to your question uh, on the 5th of October because <laughs> we will be doing a performance yeah. with a gay singer on the replica lyre in yeah. the crown around the fireplace that will be an absolutely very special performance uh, an evening concert and I think that we will absolutely know the answer to that question after we've Heard that I I'm, I strongly yeah. suspect that you won't hear a pin drop in that cranog when this performance goes ahead. I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, well, see, I, I, just briefly, see, there inherent actually in your answer is kind of part of my question as well, in so much as do we know that people at that time were speaking a form of Gaelic, or was it more like more likely to be a form of a Brythonic dialect, which actually is closer mm. to Welsh? So, yes. Uh, so, yes. so, 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 in that sense. You are making choices, I guess, as a, as a museum to connect to a more recent Scottish culture, which is fair mm. enough, and, and it is nonetheless yeah. related to Iron Age Scotland. Yeah. Um, but, but it sounds as though, as though you're trying to be sensitive to, uh, to, the, to, to, to the context of the instrument in terms of the landscape mm. and, and those sorts of settings. Um, yeah. Uh, but so, I, get, I mean, all of this, get, I guess, comes back around to this notion of, of, um, of textures. And I guess... Uh, I'm just curious, as as as, as an archaeological endeavour, um, how do you uh, how do you, do you how, sorry would you describe these sort of processes as sort of feeling your way through mm. these questions, as it were? It's not necessarily mm. that there are scientific answers to these things. Yeah, that, that's right. Yes, yeah, so that's that's true, isn't it? Um, uh, that you do get these great big question marks with with something like this. Mm. And um, um, yes, absolutely. It, it was um, um, probably, as you say, the sort of mo the, the more Welsh sort of um, uh, style of um, uh, Gaelic language uh, than today's modern Scottish mm. or modern mm. uh, Gaelic. And um, quite possibly we might be looking at Pictish ancestors if we want to try and sort of give a name or a label. Yeah. Um, if we think of the Picts having been officially recorded, uh, as it were, sort of 800 years or so after the time of our Cranog, then mm. quite possibly we're looking at their ancestors, um, unless there was some kind of mysterious mass migration that, uh, that we don't know about. Uh -huh. um, and um, that is the one thing that is so intriguing about what we do here. And I, when I used to be a tour guide here uh -huh. I often used to walk people through the museum take them onto the crown or do do demonstrations of things and then at the very end I'd say the thing is we really don't we know a lot about their life but we don't actually know who they were in terms of that that cultural that linguistic that um, um, genetic if you like sort of uh, mm. Um, uh, background and history and I used to liken it to one of those sort of murder mystery cards where you know you've got a sort of big question mark over the sort of shadow of the head of the character that you're trying to sort of um, mm -hmm, identify mm -hmm. because it's who is who is you know who is this mystery person who is Mr X because we you know that the, there's still a lot of uh, that we don't know mm. I think something as culturally significant as music and and, and as the liar well, that that's got to add some some flesh to these bones. It's, it's yeah. absolutely to for us. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, mm. I suppose, and, I suppose, and, and as, as as you were describing at the beginning, uh, you've got Mister X, I guess, uh, and you've you surrounded this 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 question mark character or Mrs X even with food, with uh, with uh, the the context of the loch itself, 
um, you, were, you probably have a great understanding of the types of trees that were around and now you've got a, mm. an understanding of, of in addition to all that some of the sounds as well hopefully as well mm. so it's uh, yeah. it sounds like it's going to be an interesting experience and if if, if I, I, I I may well be in Scotland around about there and if I do get to be up there I may well pop by and have a look at the exhibition do, do, you do yeah, yeah. absolutely you, 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 won't, you won't regret it it's, yeah. uh, it, it is absolutely fantastic yeah wonderful so thank you so much for your time today I, I really do appreciate it and also I appreciate that I've caught you very much in the in the preparatory stages for an exhibition I've been throwing like answer this question at you and you know you're not quite not quite there <laughs> yeah. yet but uh, I just simply had to highlight this because it, it is a, it is an element of prehistory in particular that is often neglected and and a little bit like children or, or for example you know the live the pathways of women for example yes. uh, these things yeah. often aren't addressed and uh, yeah. I, I think this is really interesting so thank you again yeah. and you're welcome maybe we'll be in touch in the future excellent yeah yeah absolutely yes yeah and um you know our facebook page is is, is there for people to follow us and follow all the activities that we're doing and uh, uh, and so forth and uh, um so uh, yeah yeah well uh, it's, it's a question of watch this space i think excellent excellent thank you again bye-bye you're welcome mark <laughs> cheers bye <laughs>